We are live. Um, I love saying that. Howdy. Hello, everyone. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. Uh, it is Saturday, April 20th. It's a little cold outside here in central Ohio, uh, but I wanted to come out with a dog. I'm trying out a new setup, uh, and so I'm curious to hear if you guys can hear me and see me okay. I'm outside in my backyard. Uh, I'm hopeful that some people will jump online. Uh, I would love to answer some questions live about multiple sclerosis. Let me just type in here. Howdy. Um, I've got Vicki that's joined me. Uh, I've got Brenda P uh, Potter that just joined on. How are you guys? Um, Vicki, can you hear me okay? Um, give me some feedback, guys, if you can hear me okay. I'm trying to use one of my uh, microphones here so that I can have better sound quality. Um, and so let me know if you can hear okay, please. Um, also, as many of you already know, I love it when you share where you're calling in from. So as you jump on the live stream, do me a favor um, and let me know if you can hear okay. Great sound. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I'm digging that. Um, I'm, I'm using, a, this is a little fancy for me. I have a separate camera uh, and I have a separate microphone. Uh, so I'm hopeful that everybody can hear okay. So as you come online, please make sure that you tell me where you're coming in from. Uh, I thought that we could have some coffee together. So I've got my uh, French press here, and I'm going to get that all stirred up and ready. I'm excited about that. I've got my I Am Your Father mug that my father gave me, uh, which I thought was really kind of fun. So I'm going to take advantage of that. Uh, and uh, let's have some coffee together, guys. So, cheers. Uh, I hope everybody's having a good April 20th. I hope that uh, everyone uh, has an opportunity this weekend, if you're not working, uh, to chill out and relax. And uh, here's a nice warm mug of coffee on this somewhat cold day. So, as you guys are jumping online, think about some questions for MS. Uh, this is a works in progress. I'm hopeful. Um, that will have some, uh, hey dad, um, I'm hopeful that we'll have some moderators that will come online. Last time I did a live stream, the moderators would identify a question and they would copy and paste it. Uh, and the moderator shows up as blue, so it's easier for me to find the live stream. Um, Patty asked what kind of dog I have. And you may be seeing River walking in the background. River is a four-year-old fawn American Mastiff. Uh, that's a breed that was founded in southern Ohio. They're a lot like English Mastiffs. The heads are a little smaller. They don't drool as much, and supposedly they have better hips. Um, I, River is my second uh, American Mastiff. I love this breed. Um, they're really big dogs. River is like over 170 pounds, but, but they're gentle giants. Come here, baby. Come here. You want to, so people can see you? So there's my dog, River. Um, and uh, she's running around outside. If you guys look in the back, uh, let me see if I can point. If you look right there, uh, you can actually see the chicken coop. Uh, and so the chickens are hanging out back there. Um, now, uh, in the absence of uh, having some moderators, oh, there's uh, there's a moderator. So A's HR, I hope that you uh, uh, are uh, able to help me out today. Ideally, what I'm hopeful that you can do is you identify questions in the live stream, copy and paste them uh, for me. And I will read the questions that you paste. As you guys can see, the moderator's name is in blue and it's so much easier for me uh, as I'm trying to do multiple things at once, uh, if we can do it that way. So AJ's HR, I hope that's okay with you. Um, and uh, you can throw me up some questions. Uh, while we're gearing up for AJ's HR to do that, uh, let me try to answer a couple that I can just find in the live stream right now. So Brad asks a question, and Brad says, does secondary progressive multiple sclerosis mean a change in the immune system function? Um, I don't really feel like it's a change in the immune system function. I think it's a change uh, in the, the uh, phenotype of MS. So typically with secondary progressive MS, people are having less attacks, uh, attacks less often, or they're not having attacks, and yet they're getting worse very slowly in neurological disability. They're accruing new neurological problems. Um, for example, increasing difficulties of walking separate from an attack. And I don't think that's because necessarily of a massive change in the immune response. There is some uh, studies that suggest that in secondary progressive MS, 
you still have inflammation, but it's now locked behind an intact blood-brain barrier. And so you don't see the same kind of enhancement patterns on the MRIs that you do with relapsing forms of MS. Uh, so uh, AJ, AJ's HR uh, has been willing to help me out here. So again, the request is that the moderator identify a question and then repost it, include who the person is so that we can call them out and give them credit. And that way it, it makes it a little bit easier for me to try to find them. Um, while we're gearing up to do that, let me read another question. Um, so Mary Lou Clemens writes in and says, Dr. B, can glaucoma be considered a, a sort of symptom of optic neuritis? And the answer is no. Now, the eye seems like, you know, just one organ in the eye. But in reality, there's a bunch of different parts to the eye. Uh, and in fact, many, um, many of the uh, eye specialists, ophthalmologists, subspecialize. So, for example, I mostly work with subspecialists that are neuro-ophthalmologists. Um, and they really focus on the nervous system, the back of the eye, the optic nerve, um, and then how the eyes are aligned and how the nerves control the muscles that move the eyes. There are glaucoma specialists because uh, the angle where we see glaucoma is, is in a different portion of the eye. It's a different part of the eye. Um, and so I do not think that they're uh, related. Sometimes nature is too generous and you can have multiple sclerosis and you can have glaucoma, um, and, and, but they're not really related. So as we're waiting, oh, you guys can see River in the background. My wife and daughter are taking off and River uh, wants to wish them a farewell. So there you can see that uh, 180 gorgeous pounds of Mastiff running around. Um, all right. So Homesick Nomad writes in, I'm an artist and I used to, to use thrift store paint that had lead in it. Could lead paint cause MS? And the answer is no. Lead paint cannot cause MS. Now, lead exposure, particularly during uh, periods of development, like when you're a, a kid um, and your body's still developing, can cause some very serious developmental delay. Um, and that can most certainly impact the nervous system. But no, I don't think as an adult exposure to lead paint could trigger multiple sclerosis. I don't think so. Um, we've got, let's see, 94 people online. I love this guys. Honestly, let me just take pause and say, thank you. It is really freaking cool that on a Saturday afternoon we can jump online. Uh, and, uh, I can be joined by 96 people from around the globe. Um, I sometimes refer to you guys as a global MS village. Uh, and I am really proud to be a village member. Uh, this is one of the neatest things about this YouTube channel that I never, ever anticipated was, was this experience. So thank you. Um, jumping back into some questions. So um, AJ's HR is helping me out. Um, I'm posting a question from, uh, let's see, from Latia Blank asks, hello, uh, do all people with RRMS get optic neuritis from Baltimore? So, so the question is, do people uh, with relapsing MS all get optic neuritis? The answer is no. I have many patients with relapsing MS or with progressive MS who have never had optic neuritis. Um, and so it's not a requirement to have optic neuritis to have MS. Uh, now, optic neuritis is one of the more common symptoms. So we see it all the time, but it's not a requirement. The answer is no. Um, and thank you for that question. So AJ's HR uh, has posted a question from Candy Duncan. So hello, Candy. And Candy asks, um, I went to a cannabis expo yesterday. What is the difference between cannabis and CBD? Well, now my dog is escaping. <laughs> so, so I'm hopeful that my wife's going to bring my dog back in. Actually, you're going to watch me run over there and try to retrieve my dog, guys. And then I'll answer that question. Thank you. All right. My wife saved the day. She uh, got the dog back inside. Um, so let me break this down for you. Cannabis is a plant. So cannabis is a plant that grows. It's green. It has leaves. It has flowers. And if you dry out the cannabis flowers, and you, um, then then you can have you can uh, harvest uh, the, the substances, the chemical substances on the plant. Now cannabinoids are chemicals found in cannabis, and and so a cannabis plant has a bunch of cannabinoids. I'm talking like hundreds. Two of the most common cannabinoids, the chemicals found in the plant cannabis, are THC and CBD. So CBD is one of the cannabinoids found in cannabis. So Candy, the answer to your question is cannabis is a plant and it has a bunch of chemicals in it. 
Uh, these are naturally occurring chemicals called cannabinoids. They bind to cannabinoid receptors in the body. The two most common cannabinoids are THC, which binds to the CB1 receptor. My dog just escaped. River bear! River bear! I may have to stop the live stream early to go fetch my dog. Um, I am going to go try to get my dog, and I'm going to leave the camera running live. So I don't know if you guys are going to still be here when I get back. I hope that you are, uh, but I got to go retrieve my dog. So give me a second while I run over there. Go back in here. Okay, there's 112 people. I didn't lose anyone. Okay, thank goodness. Um, so uh, hopefully my dog River stays inside uh, and we can keep asking some questions. So Candy, I hope that answered your question. By the way, guys, I published a video earlier this week. I had done a CME, uh, a continuing medical education for practitioners with a bunch of my coworkers at Ohio Health. Uh, this was done in March and it was really exciting. And the lecture that I gave was on cannabis and MS. So that is now posted as one of my videos on this channel. So Candy Duncan or anyone else that's tuning in today, if you would like to learn a lot about cannabinoids, THC, CBD, and what's the deal, then please go check out that, uh, that, that uh, CME. I, I wrote it for, and I provided it to practitioners. I'm talking about doctors and nurse practitioners and physical therapists and the like, but it's, it's a video that I hope that you find to be helpful also. So uh, let's do a couple other questions now. Um, AJA's HR is really helping me out. Thank you very, very much for your help. I'm posting a question from um, Marley C who asks, Thoughts on giving a second round of Lemtrada to someone who contracted ITP following their first round. ITP is under control uh, with treatment of IVIG and prednisone. So that's a great question. It breaks down like this. When you take Lemtrada, one of the MS medications, there's a side effect. There's a 2% risk of developing a problem where your platelets don't clot your blood which could be really serious, right? So when you cut yourself, then you wouldn't stop bleeding. Or when you got a nosebleed, you couldn't get it to stop. Or when you banged your elbow, it, the whole arm turns black and blue. And if your platelets drop low enough, that can actually cause fatal brain bleeds. So that's very serious. Now, identifying it, um, we can check that with monthly labs um, or with symptoms. And treating it as... Um, Mar Marley points out, isn't that challenging? We're using medicines that neurologists are very familiar with, um, either steroids or IVIG or both. Uh, there's a couple other ways to treat it. Now, in my clinic, I've had six cases of ITP associated with Lemtrada, uh, and they've all been uh, relatively easily treated. The question is, if I get my first round of Lemtrada, a year later, I'm supposed to get my second round. And in the meantime, if I get ITP, what do we do? And I think this is a case-by-case -case thing. Now, in the clinical trials, if that happened, uh, it was certainly appropriate, they thought, to stop. Um, I'll share with you that I have uh, made group decisions, shared decisions, where the patient and I discussed the ITP. And in many cases, we decided to retreat. So we didn't not treat. Uh, we went ahead and gave the second round. Now, I can't give you a, 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 an answer that applies to everyone. And the real answer is the clinician and the patient have to figure it out together for them, weighing the specific risks and benefits. But I will tell you that I've run into this before and I have retreated people after ITP. Um, so I've got another question uh, here uh, from Brenda. Oh, wait, where'd it go? There it is. Brenda Potter asks, uh, can you tell by the MRI how long you've had MS? And the answer is no, not really. So when you get an MRI and you see a white spot, you don't know how old that white spot is. It could have been there uh, the second day of your birth, or it could have been there the day you had the scan or any time in your life, because that white spot is not specific. It doesn't tell you the timing. Um, that spot really represents an area where there's been uh, cellular damage and there's a pool of water there and it's showing up as a white spot and it doesn't help you understand how long. The reason we do MRIs once a year most commonly is so we can go back and compare the new scan to the last year scan. So if we didn't see a spot on last year's scan, 
and we do see a spot on this year's scan, we know that lesion, that spot, is new in the last year. But if you've never had an MRI before and you have a bunch of spots, you don't know how old they are. Now, there are some ways that can help you a little bit. If you see a contrast enhancement, so after the administration of the contrast dye, the spot lights up. That tells you that spot's new, and I mean new within the last couple weeks. If there's no enhancement and there's a dark hole, and, and again, this is getting a little bit technical, but, but when there's different kinds of images. I have videos that talk about uh, T1 black holes and about the bright spots, the T2 spots. So if you have an, a bright spot and there's an associated black hole on the T1 images, that might suggest it's a bit older. But again, it's very hard. You can't really get an MRI and say, ah, it's been 10 years. Now, brain volume loss, uh, brain shrinkage, or brain atrophy is something that can happen in MS. People with MS, uh, particularly those untreated, can have brain volume loss that's up to 10 times faster than the healthy population. And so if you look at an MRI and see profound brain volume loss, you can assume that it's been there for a while. But again, you can't really tell, ah, 10 years or five years or anything like that. That was a great question. Thank you very much. All right. So um, looking down for other questions, I answered Brad's question. Um, this is great. Uh, let's all uh, thank AJ's HR for helping me out here. This is so helpful. So Mary Lou Clemens writes about the glaucoma. I answered that question. I think we're rocking and rolling. Um, so here's a question um, posted by Heather B. I feel that taking meds to treat my MS is not for me. The side effects are worse than the actual MS. Um, is getting a nutritionist and working on my health holistically a safe route? So Heather B says that medicines are not for her and she would like to try to use diet um, and holistic measures. And is that a safe route? Um, and the answer is absolutely not. No, it is not a safe route. Uh, I have many videos on my channel. In fact, I posted one last week. So Heather B, I would ask you to please go to my channel, uh, the videos and look at last week's where I said I have to get something off my chest. And I was speaking specifically about your question. And so I would ask you that you go check out that video and please leave a, me a comment. But in a nutshell, um, that might be, in my biased opinion, one of the worst decisions of your adult life, not to apply MS medicines as early as humanly possible. Now, I think nutrition is super important. I think meeting with a nutritionist is super important. But I think that's ad, uh, in addition to taking medicines. Now, Heather, you say that the medicines cause side effects, and the side effects are worse than the disease. Medicine side effects stink. Like, they're not cool, all right? And I, and I respect that. But we're not talking about treating your MS for now. We're talking about 15 years from now, avoiding things like losing your ability to walk, losing your ability to think, losing your ability to control your bladder. So um, please check out that video. But my, my strong uh, opinion is no, that's not a safe, uh, safe thing to do. So Jennifer McKnight writes in, asks, are periventricular capping a sign of MS? I've read that they are normal with aging, but I'm only 31. My first neuro uh, appointment is Friday and I'm nervous. So, uh, so Jennifer is asking a very specific question. And capping is a feature that you can see on the MRI and it is normal. Now, um, I don't. I can't show an MRI to you to kind of explain what's meant by capping. I, I, I guess the one thing that I would say, Jennifer, is if you're not a radiologist or a neurologist that is uh, trained to look at MRIs and you're just reading a report, that's an opportunity to get scared. Uh, those reports are written by neuroradiologists for neurologists. They're not written um, for uh, someone impacted by MS to pick up and read and understand. And, and I'm not trying to, to make a disparaging comment. Um, I'm not trying to say uh, you're not good enough to read it. That's not what I mean. I really feel uh, culpable and guilty that we medical providers show patients that stuff without translating it because it can incite fear. And I, I desperately want you to make sure that the neurologist goes through the blow by blow of, and shows you the images. Um, I can't tell you how often someone reads a report of an MRI and they come to me super scared. Oh, my dog's laying down. They come to me super scared. Um, and in reality, the stuff they're scared of wasn't scary. They just didn't fully understand what they were being told. So I hope that helps. All right. So Tibor, um, the last name, I'm, I'm not sure I can say it well. Usrek 
but Tibor, I'm sorry if I said your last name wrong, um, asks any MS issues with intermittent fasting? So uh, that is an awesome question. And I've done some literature reviews on intermittent fasting and the answer is no. So, so uh, in the Muslim faith during Ramadan, there's a period uh, of a month where folks don't eat or drink or smoke um, from sun up to sundown. And they're literally, so they're not eating for like 12 hours and then they can eat at night and they do that for a month. And uh, this is a very important religious holiday. Uh, and as I understand the religion, if you are healthy enough to do it, then you should. And so there's actually a, some studies done looking at uh, folks with MS who are practicing Ramadan. And it looked at what happened to them over the course of the month and afterwards, and there was no bad effects. Now, of course, any diet, is it's a good idea to check it out with your provider. So you don't want to just find an intermittent fasting diet and just start it. I would certainly want to talk to my doctor about that. But um, it's really cool that someone's done a study on that. And so it doesn't look like it's dangerous. Um, so Michelle Lau writes in, um, asks, how much does age of diagnosis affect the option for DMT diagnosed at 60? Great question. Before I answer that, let's hook up a little more French press. So age at diagnosis uh, is relevant. The average age of onset of MS is 30. And so being diagnosed at 60 is, is not common, but we do see it. We see it at our, at our center all the time. Um, but that's because we're a tertiary referral center. Um, but it's, un, it's a little bit less usual to be diagnosed at 60. Now, prognostically being diagnosed after the age of 40 is a bad prognostic outcome. And so that's a strike in the, Oh, I'm more concerned category. Uh, the other thing that we have to consider is that at 60, you're at higher risk of cancers and heart disease as compared to 30. And so I do think that for both those reasons, uh, and those are opposing reasons, that can, the medication matters. Um, I may opt not to be as aggressive in a 60-year-old with a bunch of comorbid conditions like brittle diabetes and heart disease than I would be in a 30 year old that doesn't have those conditions. So I do think that it factors in. Um, there is a horrible, terrible movement going on right now amongst some neurologists studying stopping medicines. Uh, and I have a video on this channel uh, and I think it's entitled stopping medicine at 60 question mark. And I think that is a really, really freaking bad idea. I, I absolutely do not agree with doing that. Um, and I have a video on that. And so I would, I would ask you guys to check that out. Um, you can find it uh, amongst the videos if you do a search in my channel. All right. So what other questions are cooking here? So um, I've got a question from Pup Cake Bakery. So that's kind of a cool name. Pupcake Bakery. I'm sure that my dog River would love uh, some pupcakes. I don't know what they are, but they're probably a food that's delicious for dogs. Um, so they ask, how is it uh, determined when one has transitioned from RRMS to SPMS? So, uh, so how do you determine that someone has gone from elapsing MS to secondary progressive MS? Well, first of all, as many of you know, I think those, uh, those terms are bad. I, I do not like relapsing and remitting MS, and I do not like secondary progressive MS. But before I get into why I don't like the terms, I'll try to answer the question to the best of my ability. Determining that someone is in a secondary progressive disease state is only discernible looking backwards, retrospectively. So um, you can't know, oh, I, it just happened. It's not like uh, there's a point in time, whack. And in fact, um, my mentor used to refer to a transitional period where people still have attacks, but less frequently, and they are accruing some disability, and it's kind of fuzzy. Um, but it's something that you look back and see. Most commonly, when you're looking at progression, you're looking at someone that has starting to accumulate neurological disability independent from attacks. And it's not happening over hours to days. It's happening over months. Uh, and so in hindsight, they'll look back and say, you know, I used to be able to golf uh, 18 holes twice a week. Now, I, I don't know that I could walk the whole course and I'm using a cane. And this has happened over several years, and it's happened without an attack. You would look back and say, this is a progressive disease state. 
Now, um, I have a video on progression, uh, and I talk about this in some depth. Uh, I also just really briefly want to explain why relapsing remitting MS is a bad term and why secondary progressive is a bad term. So let's just talk about that for a second. So relapsing remitting MS is a misnomer because the second word is remitting. And it makes you think that if you're not having a relapse, then you're in remission, which is not true. The immune system is constantly attacking your brain and spinal cord. And you're accruing neurological damage that doesn't show up on, uh, on clinical presentation. You don't have any symptoms, but we see spots on your MRI. Also, there's damage that's going on that doesn't show up as a spot uh, on the MRI. We can see brain shrinkage on the MRI. There's a bunch of things that are happening, and they're not stopping. So even though clinically you feel cool in the gang and you haven't had an attack in a year or two or three, you're not in remission. And so I dislike the term relapsing or remitting because I think it gives a false sense of what's going on. Um, secondary progressive MS is also not a term that I really like because people think of it as like stage two or like stage two cancer, or, you know, the next step. And that's not true. People have um, a relapsing form of MS. That means that they've had at least one attack and they could have a second attack. And there is no period of time where it turns off and they never have another attack. People in their 60s and 70s can have attacks with MS. It doesn't happen very often. Statistically, they're less likely to have an attack than when they were 30, but they still could. But here's the thing. They typically don't recover from attacks very well. So when you say secondary progressive MS, you're not out of the woods. You're not done with attacks forever. It's still possible. And the MS medicines that are approved for relapsing forms of MS work in secondary progressive MS. Um, these drugs can slow down progression in secondary progressive MS. Remember, I was talking about these terrible, awful trials that are studying stopping drug. There was one trial like that where they took a bunch of people, and I don't remember the specifics, but it was something like people 60 or older, no attack in the last five years, something like that. And they stopped all their drugs, and then they followed them. And what they found was only a third went on to have, neuro, went on to have uh, worsening neurologically. Well, that's, if that third included my mother, I would not be okay with that. Uh, we know that these drugs slow down disability progression. Uh, and so I, I don't like the term secondary progressive MS because people think, ah, well, we shouldn't treat anymore. And, and you have to keep on treating. That was a great question. Uh, it certainly got me thinking. Here's another question uh, from State. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, Stacia Nicole asks, how does having a large lesion load, um, innumerable lesions, affect patients long term? Well, it's not a good thing to see. Prognostically, it's bad to have a bunch of lesions. Um, and so the higher the lesion burden is better correlated with worse long-term outcome. Now, that doesn't mean that someone with a high lesion burden is doomed. And it doesn't mean that someone with very few lesions is, is going to skate by. Because there's something called the clinical radiographic paradox, where sometimes the person looks amazing and the scan looks scary. Or the person's not doing well and the scan doesn't look that bad. Um, they don't match up one to one. And that's important to keep in mind. But as a general rule, a heavy lesion burden isn't a good prognostic factor. All right. So here's another one. Uh, this question is asked by Miroslav Bartovic. And I hope I'm saying your name wrong. If not, I apologize. Um, my wife is on Tysabri since 2012. She is JC virus antibody positive since 2013. And the index is low. So the low index, 0.5 or less, I consider low. Do you recommend staying on Tysabri four-week intervals or switch to longer one due to PML risk? So that's a very enlightened question. Um, talking about a specific drug uh, for MS called Tysabri. The long name is natalizumab. And this is a drug that was invented. It came out in 2004 in the United States, and it's given every 28 days. Now, if you have tested positive for the JC virus and you have um, exposure to Tysabri, you're on Tysabri, there's a small risk of developing a potentially fatal brain infection. And his question is, if you're a low positive and you're on the drug, should you extend the interval from every four weeks, every 28 days to every six weeks, every 42 days? 
And there's a study going on right now trying to answer that question. Early work would suggest that spreading out the interval might decrease the risk for PML. Now, I don't know that that's gospel. I'm not sure I completely believe that it completely removes the risk because it's a really hard thing to study because fortunately, not many people get PML. But um, it looks like that might be advantageous. Now, we are participating in, in that specific trial that I just mentioned uh, where we're going to randomly assign people with MS. I'm just giving my dog some love. Hi. Um, whether four weeks or six weeks. And so the study will teach us about that. And I can tell you that anecdotally, when you move people from every four weeks to every six weeks, they don't have tolerability problems and they don't have breakthrough disease. And that's the part that's important to me. I'll share with you that I've moved people from every four weeks to every six weeks just because it's less infusions. It's less of a cost to them and it's less travel to the center. And so I've done it for that reason. Um, this is definitely something worthwhile talking to uh, your wife's MS provider about. Hi, pretty doggy. Are you a pretty girl? It's a pretty baby. Um, all right. So let's look at another question. Melody Parker asks, is neurotrophic keratitis related uh, or connected to MS? Uh, no, uh, not to my knowledge. All right. So Thomas Wolf asks, can MS cause nausea? And the answer is absolutely. Um, I have almost a constant nausea and lightheadedness, dizziness. We'd love to know if it's MS related. Now, Nausea or feeling nauseated or like you're going to throw up can be caused, of course, by many, many things. But in the brainstem, in the part of the brainstem called the medulla oblongata, there is a vomiting center. And if you had an MS attack with a lesion in the vomiting center, you could be horribly nauseated and, and vomit a lot. Um, one of my most popular videos on my channel is one, I think it's titled Rare and Unusual um, symptoms of MS that I've seen in clinics, something like that. And I go over, I think, the 10 most unusual presentations that I've ever seen. And one of them is a case of, of, of constant vomiting. Uh, and so if you haven't seen that video, you might enjoy seeing it. Uh, and I talk about uh, nausea and vomiting as an MS symptom. However, there's a lot of other things that can cause nausea and vomiting. Um, now, guys, is it hard to see me? Is there a lot of glare? Um, do me a favor and write in um, and let me know if there's a lot of glare. Uh, and so if, if you're having trouble seeing that, um, I'll move the camera around. Can you guys just type in and let me know um, if there is. I'm going to try to type a little thing here. Too much, too much glare. All right, so there is glare. All right, so let me uh, try to move this a little bit. And all right, I'm going to flip some things around. Um, oh, it looks okay. Not too bad. Uh, there is a glare. I'm going to move things around. Uh, so I, I hope we can get in the shade here. Let's try to do that. Bear with me, guys. Again, you know, I'm not really awesome at uh, manipulating the camera on the fly. Uh, but let's see if I can pull that off. All right. Let's see what we've got going on here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let me see. That's got to be a bit better. It's maybe a little bit more boring, um, but that'll work. All right. Okay, so the, it's a better for the glare. Awesome. So uh, let me know if this works out better for you guys, and uh, we can keep rocking and rolling. All right. Oh, it's better. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, uh, when I have to move the camera around on a live stream, it always makes me super nervous. I'm not a videographer. Uh, before I started my YouTube channel, I didn't own a camera. Um, and so this is all very new to me. Come here, River. Come here, River. Can you come up here and say hi? Come here. Oh, look at this big head. Look at your big head on the baby. On the couch. Let's see if I can get my dog to hang out with us. Good couch. All right, so she's hanging out there in the background. Okay, so sorry about that, guys. Um, I, I appreciate you helping me figure this out uh, and, and bearing with me while I move the camera around. Okay, so um, looking for more questions. So Valerie Heaton writes in, um, what's best for fatigue? Valerie, fatigue is the most common symptom in MS. Um, pathologic fatigue is super hard to explain to others. 
oftentimes spouses don't really understand fatigue fully. Um, and bosses certainly don't, and friends sometimes don't. It's the leading cause of loss of work in MS, uh, believe it or not. And um, it's, it's one of the most common symptoms. Now, I have a playlist on my channel. Uh, so if you go to the top of the channel, there's a button for playlist, and I have an entire playlist uh, of videos on fatigue. And so I have a lot of videos where I go into some great depth. But just to talk about some things that can help fatigue, making sure that you're sleeping well, this means enough hours of sleep and good quality sleep is a really big deal. And that's oftentimes overlooked. Um, an another thing is depression. Undertreated depression or untreated depression can cause a worsening fatigue. Um, having unchecked inflammation in your brain um, from MS can cause fatigue. And so getting on a disease modifying therapy can help fatigue. Changing your diet can actually help fatigue. Exercise is amazing at helping fatigue. Um, learning how to conserve energy, uh, the spoon theory concept, is another great way of, of managing fatigue. So, I mean, I can go on for like a year talking about things that we do for fatigue. We also use medicines to treat fatigue. Um, so one of the videos I have on the channel is what I call like the best medicines for treatment. And I talk about my preferred medicines for treating fatigue. So definitely check those videos out. Uh, please leave a comment and let me know what you think about that stuff. Um, there's 149 people online and that's really cool. Um, thank you guys for joining me this afternoon. Again, it's uh, Saturday, April 20th. Um, it's actually a really nice day in Ohio. Let me just show you uh, really quickly. It's, it's beautiful skies out. Uh, it's not gray, which is pretty awesome. It's a little bit cold, but you know, that's okay. And uh, I uh, missed you guys. I wanted to hang out with you. And so I appreciate you guys jumping online. I love this global online village. It's really, really great. Uh, thank you. Uh, looking for some more questions. So here's one, uh, a total chaos homestead wrote. Um, how do you help patients who have anxiety about taking disease modifying therapy? Someone who has had a bad experience with disease modifying therapy. So that's pretty common that folks are anxious about taking a therapy. And my solution is to not uh, rush the decision and to keep talking. And so if you're not ready to take a therapy, I'm going to talk to you about why I think it's important. We're going to discuss the pros and cons of given medicines that might be good for you. And then we're going to send you home to think about it and read about it. And when I say read about it, I'm talking about things I've written that I give you in clinic to look at. Then we bring you back to clinic where we can talk about it a second time. And sometimes people are re ready to make a decision to start a medicine today. And sometimes it takes five or six visits. Um, there's one gal that I'm thinking of right now in her mid forties, and we probably had five or six separate clinic visits before she finally felt comfortable. And I told her, I'll see you in three months. Um, I want you to talk or think about these things. And when you come back, I'm going to ask to talk to you about it again. Um, but I didn't make her do it, you know, make her do it. I can't make people do stuff. And I, I think that the key is to understand why you need to take an MS medicine and to understand the risk benefit in the context of the disease itself. That's a great question. All right. So let's see what other questions we have going on. Um, so AJ's HR is really helping me out. Uh, one of the moderators on the channel. I'm so grateful for your help. Um, the moderators identifying questions and then, and then copy and pasting them so I can find them more easily in the live stream. And so Wendy uh, writes, why does Abagio cause hair loss? So Abagio is an interesting medicine. That's one of the MS disease modifying therapies. It's a pill you take once a day. And the real name is teraflunamide. And what teraflunamide or Abagio does is it interrupts cells that are rapidly producing so they can't rapidly produce, which has a great effect for an overly active immune system. But in 11% of patients, so not everyone, just 11%, um, the rapidly producing hair, it interrupts that. And what happens is kind of interesting, I mean, interesting medically, it's not cool if you didn't want to lose your hair, is that all the cells, all the hair cells get in the same cycle. So then they're all in the same cycle and they all grow at the same time and fall out at the same time. And typically, if it's going to happen, it happens two months after taking the drug. It lasts for about four months. So at month six, it stops. 
And whether or not you stop Abagio doesn't change that. Now, I've used a lot of Abagio with patients. Um, I tend to like to use Abagio in what I refer to as the second half of the disease oftentimes. Um, and I've seen a couple people that have had some moderate or mild thinning hair and it grows back. I will tell you, I've had one patient who lost a significant amount of hair. It was one patient out of hundreds, but boy, was it upsetting to her and it was upsetting to me. Her hair has grown back um, and so she's okay, but for a while she wore a baseball hat and she was pretty pissed off at me, um, even though we had talked about it beforehand. So uh, the thing to take home is that it's a side effect. Only 11% of people have it. If you stop the medicine or not, it doesn't change the fact that it's going to go on for four months. And then the hairs, after they're in the same cell cycle, they go disparate again. So they all start growing at different rates. And so it doesn't persist. Guys, if you like what's going on, give me a thumbs up. Um, let me know. Um, we got 65 thumbs up. That's pretty awesome. So here's another question. This one is from Stephen Adams. Or excuse me, Stephen Anderson, sorry. So Stephen Anderson writes in, on Baclofen, my blood test showed that it was uh, doing liver damage. Um, my AS was high. So a AST is one of the liver enzymes. Um, I have read that my liver can repair itself. Why did this happen? Baclofen uh, is an oral pill taken to treat spasticity. Uh, I use it a lot to treat spasticity in MS. Baclofen is metabolized by the liver. So the liver breaks down the chemicals of baclofen into little pieces so you can clear it from your body. And any drug that's metabolized by the liver can really sometimes overwork the liver and cause liver damage. And so if you're on baclofen and the baclofen's caused your liver enzymes to go up, you're going to have to decrease or stop your baclofen. Um, the liver can repair itself, but that's not the way to think about it because liver damage, um, liver failure, cirrhosis can be fatal. Uh, and, and you don't want to deal with, uh, you don't want to deal with, um, a failing liver. So if the liver enzymes are going up now going, there's going up and there's going up for me when the number is two and a half times the upper limit of normal, that's where I really become concerned. So if it's just a little bit up, I may just follow it with another lab. It's when it's consistently up there. Um, two and a half times the upper limit of normal that I really become concerned. So um, this is definitely something that you want to talk to your MS provider about. This is most certainly something you don't want to sleep on um, and you don't want to suffer from liver damage. Um, my uh, hot tub over there is making some crazy scary noise. Uh, truth be told, uh, we haven't used it in quite some time and I don't know how low the water level is. So um, I'm listening to this insane noise. I hope it's not oh, there. It stopped. <laughs> um, all right. So let's look for some more questions here. Um, all right. So I'm just trying to scroll. There we go. So here's a question, uh, from, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this name very well. Raven, uh, Sarah, 11, uh, asks, how do I know if my medicine is working? So I'm assuming that you mean your multiple sclerosis disease modifying therapy. So that's how I'm going to interpret this question. How do I know if my MS disease modifying therapy is working? Well, really there's like five things. Um, so number one, you're not having attacks. Number two, you're not failing the litmus test of life, meaning you're not withdrawing from activities and pulling away. Number three, you're not having new spots on your MRI. Number four, you're not accruing neurological disability when you're examined. And number five, you're tolerating the medicine and find the safety acceptable. So if those things are going on, we typically think that it's working. Um, the, the goal of a birth control pill isn't to make you sexier. The goal of a birth control pill is to prevent an unplanned pregnancy. So if you have three children and you start birth control, you still have three children. And if my joke is if you want to know why you're on birth control, hang out with your kids, right? Because you're trying to prevent an unplanned event. MS disease modifying therapies are, are very similar in that we're trying to prevent future disability and future damage. So MS disease modifying therapies don't reverse brain damage that's already occurred they prevent new stuff from happening. So the way that you assess whether the disease modifying therapy is working in part or largely is the absence of getting worse. I hope that makes sense. Um, all right. What else do we got going on here? I love the thumbs up guys. Thank you very much. I wonder if we can get to a hundred thumbs up. That would be cool. There's 145 people online. Um, give me some thumbs up if you have a chance. I think you might have to temporarily leave the live stream and click the thumbs up and jump back in. I'm not exactly sure how that works. Um, so I've got another question from Ron from Florida. 
Um, what is your reaction to the new remyelinating drug um, from Oregon University? Um, my reaction is I am delighted that I am practicing MS in an era where we are studying remyelination. Now, I don't know that this drug is prime time yet. Uh, it's early in its research, but it's very, very exciting. It's not the only drug that's being studied for remyelination, but I think it's a really big deal. And it's my opinion that in order to beat MS, we need three kinds of drugs. We need anti-inflammatories, of which there's like 19 different uh, FDA-approved therapies that are all anti-inflammatories. So all of the FDA-approved drugs, in my opinion, are different flavors of anti-inflammatory. We need a remyelinating agent, and we need a neuroprotective agent. And right now, we only have the anti-inflammatory. So um, I'm super excited about this research that's coming out, but it's not prime time yet. Okay, so looking for some more questions. Um, here's a question from L. Preto. I hope I said that right. Um, what would be the correct definition, balance disorder, vertigo or dizziness? So that's a nice question. Um, so when someone says they're dizzy, I'm dizzy, um, I try to put that into one of three categories. Sometimes people say dizzy, and what they mean is they, it, it feels like they stood up too fast and they get lightheaded and they feel like they're going to pass out. And what they're actually describing is called presyncope. It's from lightheadedness, from low blood pressure, from standing up too quickly. So sometimes when people say dizzy, they mean presyncope. The second option when they say dizzy is they mean vertigo. Now, vertigo means the hallucination of spinning in a circle. So you feel like you're, you know, you're on a merry-go-round. And, and people will say they're dizzy and they mean they're vertiginous. They have vertigo. The, the third option is that they're unsteady on their feet, kind of like if they were drunk or on a boat and didn't have their sea legs. And that's typically a disequilibrium. So when someone says the word dizzy, I try to find out, is it presyncope, is it vertigo, or is it disequilibrium? And I put it into a category. Um, and that's how I try to do it. Now, there's 141 people online. We just have 105 thumbs up. Thank you, guys. That's freaking really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hanging outside. Uh, outside, and it's a beautiful day, uh, and I'm drinking some coffee with you, and this is super fun. All right. So let's look for some other questions. Um, it's Bittersweetest asks, um, I'm type 1 diabetic and relapsing MS and just started vitamin B1. Uh, do you recommend? Uh, well, I, I can't give you a recommendation, Sandra. Um, I can't tell you that's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, you need to talk to your provider. You know, this entire channel is all about MS education. And, you know, it's my goal to educate you and to empower you and to energize you um, to fight back and be the most awesome you possible despite having MS. But I can't answer your question uh, specifically for you um, just by reading that sentence. I don't have enough information. Um, and so as you guys ask questions, please keep in mind that the more general, the more applicable to, to everyone they are, the easier it is for me to answer. Um, the next question is from Sleepy Hollow Huskies. Not sure if I am uh, relapsing. How long does a pseudo relapse stay around? So the term pseudo relapse means that you're having a reemergence of neurological deficits in the setting of a triggering factor like an infection. So the most common that I see is someone has a urinary tract infection, and in the setting of the urinary tract infection, their old neurological deficit that had gotten better comes back out. Like they had gone blind from optic neuritis in the past, they regained vision, and now with the urinary tract infection, they're losing vision. And typically, after the infection clears, then the vision returns. Uh, and so I, temporarily, I would expect it to get better after the trigger had been removed. Now, exactly how long can it go on? I mean, this could go on for days or weeks, um, and really you need to work with your provider to sort it out. Um, you bring up a good point that as a human being, you don't know whether it's an attack or a pseudo attack or even something not related to MS. You just experience something. You just experience a symptom. And so that's where it really pays off to partner with the MS neurologist and with your, with your clinician that's working with you to help sort it out. Uh, because we can do testing in various ways to try to help figure out, hey, this is coming from an attack or this is something different. That was a good question. All right, so you got some other questions here. So Andrea Shoup writes in, um, 
I'm six weeks post round two of Lemtrada, um, and I'm in a relapse. Does this mean it isn't working? No, it does not mean it's not working. So um, when we take Lemtrada, and everybody gets the first two doses, the first two courses, so you get five days, wait a year, three days, then we don't retreat unless you have an attack or new spots. And when you look out eight years, about 50% of people never got redosed, which means they went the full eight years and never had another attack. 30% got a third course, which means 30% of the people had an attack or new spots on the MRI. And something roughly like 13-ish uh, percent got a fourth round. And so my point here is, is it doesn't mean it didn't, it didn't work. Uh, the reason is because unlike drugs that are trying to block um, what Lemtrada is doing is it's trying to reboot your immune response. So if you're using another drug, let's say like Tysabri, which blocks cells from entering the brain and they break through, well, then it didn't work. And mechanistically, you wouldn't think that giving more Tysabri would like, would prevent that from happening again. But if you took Lemtrada and you're trying to induce the immune system to change its behavior, and then you have an attack, it's reasonable that you could re-up. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the answer. And the way I, I, I think about things, after you've had the first course Lemtrada, wait a year, the second course Lemtrada, if you have further uh, disease activity, whether that be an attack or new spots in the MRI, we hit pause and we talk about one of three options. Let's not do anything else and see what happens, which is not my favorite option, but it is an option. Let's retreat Lemtrada with a third course a year after the second course. Or let's switch drugs. And by the way, of course, I'm going to treat that attack. So definitely something that needs to be thought about. I don't view that as a, a, a failure. Um, so I've got a question from Rit Tarek. Uh, I'm not sure I said that right. Rita Eric? I'm not sure. Rita. I'm just going to say Rita77 asks, how soon does Ocrevus work? I had my first infusion. So Ocrevus uh, is one of the MS medicines. Um, it's an infusion taken twice a year. And when we look at cleaning up new contrast enhancing lesions, that happens uh, almost completely within six months. It takes longer than six months to suppress new T2 lesions. And so the, you know, we have to have an understanding of the duration. If you were on Ocrevus and had an attack or new spots in the first six months, I think, I personally think it's too early to throw in the towel and to say, oh, it didn't work. Um, I think that it takes longer for the drug to be fully effective. Guys, I'm going to tell you, this coffee is completely cold, but that's not going to prevent me from drinking it because coffee is still delicious even when it's cold. All right. So let's see what else we have cooking here. I've got 146 people online. There's 111 thumbs up. Thank you. Um, we've been online for 52 minutes, and I'm probably going to go to just about 60 minutes and wrap this up. So time for some more questions. Um, here's one from Dom Shadbolt. Dom Shadbolt asks, Aaron, which is me, hi, um, does Ocrevus use delete CD20 activity permanently, leaving a non-recoverable immunocompromised state? The answer is no. So Ocrevus is an antibody which targets cells that express CD20. And um, we're to, that, those are B cells, but they're not all the B cells. The stem cells, the baby B cells, do not express CD20. And the plasma cells that make antibodies do not express CD20. But in between, the adult B cells in between do. So when you give Ocrevus, you kill adult B cells, but the pluripotent stem cells are still there, and they grow back in six months. And the reason we give the drug every six months is because when those cells mature, then we kill them. Also, you still make antibodies. And so when your immune system needs to make an antibody, you still have plasma cells to do that. So no, you are not creating a permanent immunocompromised state. Good question. So Crow Feather Luck writes, um, do all fatigue medicines cause anxiety? Um, like now I'm on modafinil three to four days in a row, then off for two to three days in a row. Um, um, do all of them have anxiety as a side effect? No. Um, it's not a foregone conclusion that you're going to be anxious. Now you could be, um, most commonly we use modafinil, um, or, uh, which is provigil or, um, 
we use armadafinil, which is new vigil, or we use some form of amphetamine stimulant like Adderall or uh, something like that. And those all could cause anxiety. Um, it's, it's certainly a symptom, we, a side effect that we can see, but they don't always. And I have some patients where modafinil makes them anxious and Adderall doesn't. Um, and everybody's chemistry is a little bit different. Um, but that was a good question. So let's see. Let's take one more question uh, and then we'll wrap up today. Uh, and so let me see if I can get one more question cooking here. Um, so here's a question uh, that uh, AJHR has posted from BeMind10, uh, who writes, Dr. Boster, my husband had hep C and was on medicine for this. I have noticed um, that the same medication for MS, which interests me as, um, as I have MS, is interfere on the same one used with hep C. Awesome question. Now, Hepatitis C is an infection of the liver, and MS is an autoimmune condition. And there's a type of interferon used in both, but they're not the same interferon. So when we treat MS, we're using interferon beta, interferon beta products. And there's trade names like uh, beta seron and stavia and rebif and avonex and plegarity and stuff like that. When you treat hepatitis, there's an interferon product, but it's a different kind of interferon. It's not interferon beta. So they're not the same thing. Uh, they're, they're quite different. Uh, that was a great question. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap up. I want to say a couple thank yous. I want to give a really big thank you to AJ's HR, who um, jumped online to participate and got roped in as a moderator to posting these questions. So thank you very, very much. I also want to thank the over 100 people that jumped online to hang out with me and have some coffee with me on a Saturday. Thank you for that. Um, you guys mean a lot to me. I really appreciate the love that you show. I love this growing online community. I'm going to continue to pump out uh, videos. I'm trying to publish one to two a week. Uh, to be honest with you, I have a bunch of videos saved up that I've made and I have to fight the urge to like publish them all because I want to share with you so badly, but I'm going to make myself wait and meter them out one to two a week. Uh, I love these live streams. It's so awesome to connect with you. It, it, it feels great and I really appreciate the questions and I love reading the comments. Um, as soon as the live stream's over, I go back through and I read all the comments um, and I'll record down any that we may have missed so I can answer them in the future or answer them on a video. My name is Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. So until my next video or my next live stream, take care, guys.